Good afternoon. This is Jeff Riley, the Commissioner of Education. Thank you for joining us today. Today we're talking about the Student Opportunity Act. This bill recognizes that we have some serious opportunity and achievement gaps in student performance. It's a progressive bill and, in theory, it gives more money to districts that have more needy kids. In fact, about 85% of the dollars are going to about 37 districts, which means everyone else will get some money, which is good, but maybe not as much as they had hoped. Some districts may not even have enough to cover some of their rollover costs. But the law does not differentiate and requires that every district create and submit a three-year evidence-based plan to me describing how new and existing funds will be allocated to close these gaps. The good news is that we are approaching this mandate differently. Rather than doing the typical one-size-fits-all model, we've decided to bifurcate this approach and not make it just another bureaucratic exercise. For example, if you're one of those districts getting a lot of the money, in this case $1.5 million or more, you're going to have to submit a long form, a more extended plan. If you're getting under $1.5 million, you will complete the short form. And we are having the short form meeting today, so that's what we're doing today. We have tried our best to keep both forms simple and straightforward, but we will go into details about these forms over the course of the next hour. We understand that we currently require you to provide information to the department using various templates, but in the future we seek to create one unified system that allows you to submit all the information required uh, by us at the state in one place and at one time. This will take some time, but we look forward to getting there to make things easier for you in the field. In short, we'll be looking to streamline how we collect information from you en masse, but again, we, we ask for your patience. At the end of the day, we have a new law that must be implemented, but our goal is to minimize the amount of time you spend on paperwork so that you can maximize the amount of time you spend doing the work with and for our students. With that, I know you're eager to dig in and get going, so I'm going to turn it over to Senior Associate Commissioner Russell Johnson to go into the details of the SOA. Russell, are you with us? Thanks, Commissioner. Yes. Great, glad to get going with you all. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I have a, an echo, so I wonder if uh, we could just try to address that real quick. Okay, so um, as Commissioner Riley said, I'm Russell Johnston, Senior Associate Commissioner, and I'm also joined today by my colleague, Dan Anderson, what will happen is that I will guide you through the presentation and Dan will actually pause from time to time to take your questions. We have a lot of different people in the room in Malden who are ready to help out. So as you have questions that you will enter through the chat feature, we'll make sure that we pause at various intervals and help to get those answered for you. So thinking about what we're going to cover today on slide three here, I want to note that our webinar is being recorded. Uh, this is the first time that Desi is actually using Zoom technology for this type of presentation. And we're really glad that what it allows for us to do today is to involve a wide variety of leadership and leaders from across our districts who will be developing the student opportunity plans. So we know that we have teams of people participating. We have teams that involve district leadership and union leadership, school committee members, uh, legislative delegates, with us and so we're really glad that you're all here we hope that we get questions from a wide variety of stakeholders who are engaged in this call and as i mentioned the questions need to be submitted through the chat feature for a couple of reasons one is that we want to make sure we capture what you're asking us about as we go uh, there might be some questions that we can't answer today and so by soliciting through them through the chat we're able to ask for your input um, get your ideas, and then if we can't answer something today, we'll follow up afterwards. Um, if people are participating uh, without video, without being able to see the presentation, without being able to type in their chat questions, uh, we'll make sure that and um, you can easily find our email address where you can submit your questions to so that we can follow up. And um, the, let's take a look at the agenda for today. Uh, we'll, um, we've heard from the commissioner, and we're going to talk about some of the um, important commitments that are included in the plans that are based on statutory requirements for those plans. We have some suggestions for successful planning. 
Uh, we want to go over what we um, recommend as some evidence-based programs, but then talk about options to customize those programs for your district. And uh, then show you and walk you through how to use the checklist that we created for the development and beginning drafting of your plans that you will submit to us by April 1st. And then finally, we'll just conclude with some next steps. And all throughout, just really encourage you to ask questions. So Q&A is at the end, but it's also all throughout this presentation. Um, I hope to see some questions popping up in the chat feature so that we can begin to hear what's on your mind. You can give us a thumbs up if you're understanding. You can uh, ask for um, anything clarifying or probing, uh, but we want to make sure we serve your needs as we go through this presentation. So uh, just kicking off, um, we want to make sure that you are grounding yourselves in what the requirements are that are in the statute. So the Student Opportunity Act, as it relates to these plans, has four key elements that we want to make sure we direct your attention to. The first is about the evidence-based programs and making sure that we really use um, evidence-based programs that are based on student needs. So uh, how, what do we know about the disparities uh, facing um, our student subgroups? And how will we begin to think about, in that second bullet, um, combining our resources, not only just the Chapter 70 funds, but also other state and federal funds in order to create better opportunities, better um, experiences through these evidence-based programs for our students in our schools. We know that monitoring our effectiveness is very important. So in the statute, there's a real focus on establishing targets and then monitoring our targets, uh, monitoring our progress towards those targets. And then finally, um, we appreciate that in the statute, there's an emphasis on family engagement not only in the development of these plans, but as an ongoing process to support the implementation and to really get uh, buy-in and shared uh, and delegated ownership of the plans and the key activities that you will be implementing as a result of these plans. So what I really like about what we've done with the template and the guidance document that we shared with you earlier this week on Monday, and again, I'd strongly encourage you to have that document out in front of you if you don't already, uh, we have uh, some links in the chat feature. The nice thing about the chat feature is you can always scroll back up and you can click on the link where it will take you right to the spot on the commissioner's website where we have uh, stored the um, documents for you that you can use for this. And um, what we would want you to do is take a look at how we've translated those core requirements from the statute into four commitments that we want districts to respond to when they develop their plans. And we think these commitments are important, not just for planning purposes, but really ongoing. Um, how we may see that the spirit of the law is drawn out in these commitments. So you'll see that the commitments begin with a focus on uh, student subgroups and the data that we know about them. Then we look at how you might adopt, deepen, or continue some specific evidence-based programs, monitor their effectiveness, and engage families all throughout. So again, a real one-to-one -one correspondence between the requirements of the statute and then how we've taken those requirements and tried to reword them in language that we're all familiar with as educators and that we would feel motivated to work to implement through these plans. So I'll say more about each of these four commitments and how they are built out into the plan guidance that we've shared with you. Uh, but I wanna first help orient you to the, those requirements by thinking about and sharing with you some ideas that we have for successful planning. As you get into this process, here are some ideas that we have uh, to hope to guide that and, and um, hopefully make those plans as strong as they can be. So the first really about those evidence-based programs, uh, I'm gonna say more about this as we go along, but we have described 17 for you, put them into categories, and I'll describe a little bit more about that in a minute. But the important thing about this is that if you choose from our 17 categories, uh, our 17 evidence-based programs, um, or select from the nine that are in the statute, we know that you will be in compliance with the requirements of the statute. Uh, you don't have to question whether or not you're on the right path. Uh, there is an additional option for you to propose an evidence-based program outside of the list that we've prepared for you or that are embedded in the statute itself. And I'll say a little bit more about how you might go about deciding what that 
additional evidence-based program might be and our role in um, supporting you any evidence -based, uh, additional evidence-based program that you might describe. The, the second piece that we really want you focused on as it relates to developing your plan and getting going on the planning process is about community and family engagement. Now, the important thing about this is that it's both a requirement of the plan that you develop. We will wanna know, and a statutory requirement, is that you're involving a wide variety of stakeholders, including your school committee, your special education parent advisory council, your English language, uh, your English learner parent advisory council. Uh, they're all listed in the statute, you can find them there. That is about the development of the plan. But I really wanna make sure I stress that ongoing parent involvement is really at the, the core of these plans, you see that if you go back up, it's that fourth statutory requirement, it's our fourth commitment. So I want you to be thinking about community engagement as both a key component of developing the plan, but also something that is living on beyond the development of the plan, um, and really making sure that, again, we have uh, that shared ownership of the implementation of the plan. And you'll see how we've broken that out in the actual guidance document that we prepared for you and uh, the information you'll be sharing back from, with us in the form of the plans that you develop. So another thing that's important about planning at this time is to be thinking about how much you're taking on. And what we really wanna make sure that we do uh, with you is to make sure that those evidence-based programs are really focused on the subgroup issues that you identify from within your district. The plans, as you will see, are especially for short form districts, are meant to be brief, they're concise. They're really focused on this core issue of how do we close achievement and opportunity gaps. So it's not like your entire district improvement plan. It's a very focused plan, a uh, very concise plan around closing achievement gaps. And I know that having been a district leader, having been a teacher in Massachusetts, there sometimes is that feeling of, uh, are we just layering on more and more, or are we being focused on a few key initiatives? And so what we want you to be thinking about is, is this an opportunity for you to take on a new evidence-based program, or is this an opportunity for you to continue something that you're doing well, or to deepen existing priorities that are evidence-based? That's really the conversation that we want you to be having right now with your key stakeholders um, to talk about what does this moment mean for our district and how will we use it to drive further clarity and coherence about our district's priorities, again, which are very focused on closing achievement and opportunity gaps. And then finally, when you think about these evidence-based programs that you're going to develop, make sure that you are thinking about how you are aligning all available resources um, not just Student Opportunity Act funding, uh, but also federal and other state dollars. Uh, we intend to hopefully provide some additional state funding, for example, aligned to these priorities, because we know when we really row together and focus on it, doing a few things well, we can all get further. Uh, but doing it in a, um, as a comprehensive a way as by combining as many resources as we can to focus on these key priorities. And then, you know, one thing that I really uh, love about what we're trying to do with these plans is the focus is not so much on the document itself, but it's about implementation. So we've provided, again, this bifurcated way of collecting plans. You are the short form districts, as you can see from the template or the, uh, the filled in template, the sample uh, plan that we've provided for you, they are brief. And so, because we want you to tell us what you plan to do, but we really want you to spend as much energy as you can on high quality implementation. And so um, really, as you're going to develop your plans, make sure that you're looking at the one that we shared with you, that filled in template, that sample completed template, to think about, we're, we're expecting something of about this length. Uh, we really, again, want you to make sure that you're focusing on uh, implementation and we intend to support that uh, with our assistance activities, with our monitoring, as best as we can going forward. So that was a lot. And I would love if there's any opportunity now to answer questions that are coming up in the chat. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Dan Anderson, um, again, who's gonna to attempt to respond, respond to what you've already been typing in. If you have other ideas though, uh, start putting them in the chat. 
If we don't get through your questions now because you're asking questions as we're going to answer them, we will pause again for another Q&A a little further in the presentation so that you're able to ask those questions or get answers to those questions that you start to pose maybe you would like us to get in as we go to start answering the questions that are already in the chat. So Dan, I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, glad for you to um, work on some, uh, some answers to some of the questions you're getting in. Good afternoon, thanks Russell. We have a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, the first question that came in uh, asked about expanding to full day kindergarten and whether that would fit under the expanded access to early childhood uh, priority. Uh, yes, that would fit in, particularly based on uh, the G criteria, which included uh, expanding early uh, education in pre-kindergarten. So that totally fits. We got another question uh, related to charter schools, whether charters are required to submit short or long form plans. Charters are not requ uh, required to submit a plan by April 1st. There's further guidance that will be coming from the charter school office to clarify how charter schools should expect to proceed. We got an additional question or a couple of questions about districts that are not receiving major changes in funding. Uh, all districts are required to submit plans by the law. So that is everyone. As Russell indicated though, districts can focus plans on continuing existing efforts that they're making to express, uh, to address disparities in how their students are served. And so that's one area that districts can uh, focus on if there's not a major change in funding. With that one, we're gonna pause and go back to Russell and we'll continue to take questions at the next break. Thanks. Great, thanks Dan. So I wanna talk a little bit more about the evidence-based programs that are included both in the statute as well as 17 that we've created for you to consider as key priorities for your district. So on the next two slides, we've actually organized those 17 evidence-based programs into four categories. And so the first is about enhanced core instruction and how we can make sure that core instruction is really aligned to the goal of closing achievement and opportunity gaps. So you'll see five items here, five priorities here that you might choose one of, um, perhaps more, but again, few key priorities that we want you focused on um, for your district. You'll see that we have targeted student supports as the second area, talent development, as the third, and conditions for student success as the fourth. So if you look back at the enhanced core instruction ideas here, you'll notice that we have three that are in bold. Those are of high priority to the commissioner and DESE. And we wanna make sure that we guide your attention there as um, priority ideas for you to be thinking about. But at the same time, know that these are areas that we intend to invest in further, and we are likely to offer some additional grant funding that would be in the form of competitive grants that we hope that we'll be able to support uh, the implementation of these evidence-based programs. Then um, you'll notice that we also have diversifying educator and administrator workforce as another high priority area for the department. And again, we're we'll likely to have additional component funds uh, to support your implementation of that particular priority if you choose it. Now, in addition to the 17 that DESI has created, there are nine, A through I, on this slide that are in the statute. So if in your plan to us, you identify one of those nine or any of the 17 that I've just showed you, Again, you'll know that you are in compliance with the requirements of the statute. And what we did in the guidance document that we shared with you on Monday is we listed, again, the 17 high priority evidence-based programs from the department, and we matched them in a coded way in a, with a key at the bottom of that section of the document with how each of the evidence-based programs aligns with the program categories that are included in the statute. Again, A through I on this slide. So there might be some ideas though that a district has that they wanna to propose to us as um, an additional evidence-based program. And we would encourage you to have that as a creative thinking, that type of problem solving, 
relative to the needs of uh, student subgroups in your district. And um, you are certainly welcome to uh, uh, propose evidence-based programs, um, but we would want to make sure that we know, again, that there's a strong evidence base to support those programs. We also hope that the nine ideas from the statute itself are pretty comprehensive ideas that you might have already. But again, we welcome any questions that you might have about the uh, evidence-based programs we've described or those from the statute, as well as any that you might be proposing as well. Excuse me, Russell? Yes, please. This is, yep, this is Helene in Malden. There are some times where you're fading in and out a little bit, and we're not sure if you're away, moving away from the microphone in some way, but there were a few moments recently that you were cutting out. I just wanted you to be aware. Okay, thanks, Elaine. I okay. am holding the um, phone right up to my mouth, so I will Okay, continue. all right, so I it's the uh, technology. Is that any better? You sound clear right now. I would say 90% of the time you were fine, but the commissioner was saying just project a little bit, and that'll okay. help. I will continue to work on that. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so we also included for you a checklist that we want you to use to be able to support your implementation um, and your development of your plans. And so if you would, I would advise if you take out the checklist and then at the same time, if you can, take a look at the completed template that we provided for you, the sample template. And we think that that will be really useful for you as you um, compare our checklist and the types of activities that we're recommending to you against the completed form and see how the two fit together. Uh, so to begin with, as we think about focusing on student subgroups, um, we would um, ask that you uh, begin to think about and do that data analysis about your district's data and what you know about students of color, low-income students, English learners, students with disabilities, and feel free to use any of the available data that you have from us, uh, particularly and local data, in order to describe those areas where uh, you have gaps in student achievement in the district. And then, you know, from there, um, once you, again, um, probably further clarify uh, data that you are already looking at, I'm sure in, in many and most cases, you know a lot about that subgroup data, uh, we would ask that you then work towards um, thinking about which evidence-based program that you might select. And um, when you see, uh, for example, uh, very soon, uh, even by tomorrow, you should be getting descriptors from us of the 17 uh, evidence-based programs. And a lot of the language that we've provided you or that we will provide you, we think will be really useful to you if you select any of them um, and want to uh, include them in your uh, in, in the template that you're going to fill out, in the plan that you are going to submit to us. And so we're hopeful that the language that we provide you through, that, uh, through those program descriptions, uh, that you'll just be able to use that directly, uh, cut and paste right from those documents into your short descriptors of the evidence-based programs so that you don't have to do maybe as much legwork, but we know that you will want to customize them. You'll want to describe, for example, what does inclusion and co-teaching mean for our district? You'll see language from us describing what inclusion is, the evidence base for it, as well as the um, what some key components, what frankly you might use resources to further develop in the way of inclusion in your district. Uh, but we want to make sure that we customize it so that it's your plan. Um, Desi's ideas, but your plan very much. And so uh, you'll describe those programs. Um, you'll talk about how they are evidence-based, as I just mentioned. And then really wanting to make sure that you tie that to the budget information. So again, if you look at the table, the very brief table that's in the short form, you'll see that we want to know what resources you are going to allocate um, to those evidence-based programs. And again, it's very succinct information, very um, uh, you know, concise information that we're asking for to align, again, resources to programs. The, um, the third area that we want to look at, and, and this is, um, I want you to really lean in on this uh, and listen closely because this is an area where uh, we want to make sure we get it right with you and dispel as much confusion as we possibly can. So what you will need to do with us is in the plan that you will submit to us again by April 1st, you need to show us uh, kind of what are the metrics that you are going to use to judge your progress, to evaluate your progress. We know again, 
spirit of the lock, embedded in the lock, is this focus on monitoring, monitoring for outcomes. And so we want to know what you're going to use. If you've chosen um, evidence-based programs, what's the metric you're going to use to evaluate your progress towards that, uh, towards that key um, uh, implementation of programming? And uh, we, again, that's the what. What are we going to look at? Um, now, this is really important. This year, school year 20, is the planning year. And so it's really the baseline year for the targets. So as we select the metric, again, the what we're going to measure, the to what extent do we, are we successful, that those are the targets, and they are based on this year's data. So when you submit your plan to us, you're going to tell us what the metric will be, but we don't know the targets in many cases for many of these data elements. We, haven't, we don't know what the baseline is yet, because, uh, for example, if you choose an MCAS target, we need to get the MCAS results from this screen in order to then have a baseline and set three years worth of targets off of that baseline. So all you're going to submit to us by April 1st is the what. What are the metrics? And then after that, um, again, in the fall, if you choose a, one of our metrics, a metric that we collect the data on and that we um, report the data on, um, we would actually uh, um, fill in those targets in your plan so that you don't have to. But then we'll ask you to verify that information. We'll ask you to make sure that um, as we put that in, that you are fully knowledgeable that uh, what baseline that we've set and what target you would be working towards. You can also identify your own target, your own metrics, maybe something that you don't collect, um, as well as your own targets. Um, and in those cases, if you select your own metrics, something again that we don't collect and report on, uh, then you would actually have to populate that information once you have the baseline information from this year. But we know that there might be some questions on this. And so uh, metrics and targets are a very important part of the statute. Uh, and so if you have questions, again, really welcome you to put them into the chat feature uh, so that we know what they are when we pause in just a second to get more of your questions. Uh, but we look forward to knowing what you might need to know about targets and metrics. And then finally, uh, the commitment for engaging all families. Uh, we, um, again, the, the final section of this plan is really about how are families part of implementation? How are families part of what you are going to continue to do in an ongoing way? And frankly, how are you going to engage families that are often somewhat disenfranchised or uh, sitting a little bit on the outsides of um, you know, the schooling experience. So our, uh, for example, our, our families of students who are English learners, um, how are we going to engage them? Uh, something that we really want you to, uh, to describe as part of this plan. And how are you going to increase family engagement, frankly, as part of your efforts? So uh, finally, um, in the checklist, you'll see that we um, have some certifications that you'll need to be able to do uh, to, um, to uh, show to us through the completed form that you will send in by April 1st. So first, we want to make sure that um, you certify to us that you have engaged stakeholders as, as described by the law uh, through the development of the plan. So again, this is separate than the ongoing family engagement that you will also describe. We want to know how the community was involved in the development of the plan. Uh, we'll want to know more about the uh, stakeholder engagement process and um, who was involved. Uh, in, the, uh, um, in the process of getting feedback on the development of the plan. And then finally, uh, we really emphasize that the school committee, your school committee, should vote on the plan, particularly because the plans have budgetary and policy impl implications. And so we'll want to know uh, when the school committee voted and the date uh, and what the outcome of the vote was. So we hope that the checklist, uh, especially when you compare it against the, uh, the template form that we've shared with you will just help you get started on developing uh, the information that you will submit to us. Uh, we think that it's important that um, you know exactly what we're going to be asking for because we will have an electronic form available for you by mid-March and uh, that form will match exactly what you see right now in the template. So you can start drafting, you can start writing, you can start gathering the data that you so that by mid-March when the electronic form becomes available for you, it will be easy for you to 
uh, complete that and submit it to us on time. So again, I'm glad to pause and see what kind of questions have come up. Uh, Dan, I'm turning it over to you. Thanks, Russell. We got one question about whether uh, regional uh, schools with superintendency unions need a plan for each district. Yes, uh, all each district does need to have its own plan. We, we again got another question about whether uh, kindergarten programs can be included in the early education and pre-K priority. They absolutely can. Uh, we got another question asking whether the monies uh, coming in this way supplant or, or whether they can supplant or whether they must supplement. We're going to be addressing that further in uh, upcoming FAQ that we'll be releasing to provide a little more clarity to districts on exactly how funds can be used. Another question we got had to do with school size and schools that will uh, they're a little bit small uh, in terms of whether or not they have subgroups. And Associate Commissioner Rob Curtin is going to talk a little bit about that situation. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as, as far as, uh, as the question came in, um, it references schools. So just a reminder that we're talking about outcome metrics um, at the district level. This is not for setting, having, districts don't need to have outcome metrics for every school or multiple metrics for every school. This is all done at the district level. Um, so if that is still a, um, a, possi a, a problem where the subgroups might be too small at the district level to do any sort of outcome metrics for any subgroups, um, I would just encourage you uh, to send me an email and get in touch and we can talk about it specifically. Thanks, Rob. Uh, we had another question about charter schools and when they will know about their funding. I just want to say again, uh, the charter school office will be putting out some guidance on that one. And last, there was a question about whether or not uh, you could see exemplars. We actually have exemplars in the guidance, both the short form plan guidance and the long form plan guidance, respectively, to try to shed some light on how uh, those plans can look. Russell, I think we're going to come back to you and then we'll return for more questions after the next section. Great. Thanks, Dan. So getting started. As I've already mentioned, a key next step is to be thinking about how you're planning for and organizing stakeholder engagement. So uh, we, we hope that it's helpful that you see our, our draft um, about uh, description of how stakeholders might be involved, but use that draft template for um, beginning to uh, put together your ideas um, so that you can uh, gather your thoughts, gather the information you need to be able to submit the plan to us uh, once you get our electronic form. Um, if you have questions for us, you see the email address that's on your screen right now. Uh, submit any and all questions to that, that email address. And we're really hoping that people will use that uh, to get it's sort of a, a one-stop shop for people to get their questions to us. It's being monitored closely by the commissioner's team and they'll make sure that they get the information out, uh, get those questions answered from across the department, uh, that they will uh, triage and get to the right person so that you are able to obtain the information in a very timely way. So everywhere we can, we're, we're just wanting to share that, uh, that email address, again, soaplans at DOE. Uh, dot mass dot edu. In fact, as I'm looking at the slide, it looks like we maybe need to put a, um, a, a period into that email address. Uh, and then um, thinking about the support that we're providing, um, we've heard from a few districts that they're not aware of their Chapter 70 funding for next year uh, and the funding, um, including the funding that they will be getting through the Student Opportunity Act. So we are going to put up on our website a full list of the funds that districts will be receiving by February 10th. So if you're listening to this and you're not quite aware yet of the funding that you will be receiving, just know that you'll be able to find it again. Uh, all information about the Student Opportunity Act is included in the link that we've been putting up in the chat. And so you should be able to go there and get the information that you need uh, on February 10th. The other thing that we want you to know is that the summaries that I've been describing of the 17 programs that we are emphasizing through the Student Opportunity Act will be available by uh, very, very soon, perhaps even as soon as tomorrow. Uh, and each summary um, will include contact information for someone at the department who you can turn to to get more information. So as much as we definitely want you using that Student Opportunity Act plans email address for kind of general questions, uh, if you have a specific question about one of our evidence-based programs, you can use the contact information 
that will be included with the one to one and a half page description of each of those programs uh, when we get those descriptors out to you again very soon. Then uh, we understand, we know that between this webinar that we're doing today and the one that we're doing for long form districts tomorrow, uh, there are lots of questions that districts might have. They may not have been able to participate in our webinar today. And so what we'll want to do is to make sure that we put out an FAQ uh, that um, shares the answers to the questions that you've asked, that shares the answers to the questions that have come up elsewhere so that we can be as helpful as we can be uh, to get you the information that you need. And then like I've already mentioned, uh, just making sure that you direct your questions to our one-stop shop email address. Um, so with that in mind, uh, those are the kind of key details that we wanted to share with you today. Uh, Dan, I'm going to turn it back to you to see if anything else has come up in our in the chat box. Thanks, Russell. Appreciate that. We did have a couple more questions come in. Um, we had one question about SOA allocation amounts uh, and how much, uh, for how districts can determine how much more they're getting as a result of SOA. We want, uh, want to encourage districts to identify, if they're not sure, an appropriate amount towards programs. We're not going to be giving an exact breakdown about how much is coming from this. We also had a couple of questions about school committee. Uh, first, there was a question about the uh, timeline for the template uh, coming out and wanting to be able to submit. We just wanted to clarify that the template in the guidance is the template, so there's not an additional template that's coming out. The submission platform that's going to be coming later is just the tool through which you'll submit on the same template that you have now. So if you're looking to make sure that you're presenting to your school committee and your stakeholders an accurate depiction of what you have, you can do that with the current template that you have through the guidance. Uh, there was also a question about school committee timelines and uh, whether or not votes are able to be scheduled in advance of the April 1st deadline. Uh, we wanted to make sure that it's clear that uh, if you can't get in a vote at the same uh, before the deadline, while the plan needs to be submitted, it can be submitted and then the certification of the school committee vote can be done uh, after that has occurred. And we really wanted to differentiate that there's sort of two different items here. There's a school committee vote on, their, on a, your budget, and then there's the school committee vote on SOA plans, and those are two separate elements. We're going to pause to just see if there are any more questions that have come in. There, uh, there was a question about how the information is going to get out. There's going to be an uh, FAQ that's posted on the website. And the screen right now that you can see, there's a link to the Commissioner's Special Advisory on SOA, and that's a location where we will continue to post updates and any crucial information related to the Student Opportunity Act. There was a question about funds and the uh, timeline for when they'll come in. The Student Opportunity Act itself is on a seven-year phase in with additional details that we're going to get from year to year to make sure that we have a clear understanding of the exact picture for each district. All right, thanks. Looks like those are all the questions that we have right now. We're really eager to make sure that we address any other questions. And so this email address we put out, soaplans at doe.mass.edu, we're really eager to bring in more. And as we said about the FAQ, we want to make sure that we uh, hear from you directly with your questions so that, because other folks likely have those same questions, and we want to make sure we provide clear information. Uh, with that, we'll turn it back over to Russell. Great. Thanks, Dan. And really appreciate everyone being on the call with us today. Uh, we really value your questions, uh, your interest in making sure that you know what you need to know, know in order to complete your plans. Um, like Dan said, feel free to get any other further questions to us um, at our uh, email address. And uh, we'll use the FAQ uh, to make sure that when we see, again, uh, other questions that come in over time, that we respond to them through the FAQ. They provide you with the information that you need in response to questions that are asked from the state. So, with that in mind, uh, we're going to conclude today's session. Uh, but again, we're available to help out in any way that you need as you work to complete this important project.
process. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks for being on the call today.